Uh, I'm Ravikant and uh, I welcome you all to CSTS and to this uh, book launch by uh, three Bihari, uh, edited by three Bihari boys. Uh, on behalf of uh, the staff and uh, you know, faculty of CSTS, I welcome you all to this very happy occasion. I see friends all around, so it's, it's going to look more like those tarpan than lokarpan, meaning that you, you know, release it in front of your friends rather than a public, which is, but uh, <laughs> since it is being recorded and because the earlier proceedings also of the two workshops uh, from the project uh, have been uploaded, this may be uploaded, this discussion as well. And uh, I was wondering as I looked around, whether the names of the discussants and the, uh, are names taken by servants uh, in uh, North India or so South India, I don't know much about. And I was, Prabhu, you'll find uh, lots. Deepu is lucky, he's Avdhendra and Deepu both. So Deepu saves him. Pankaj, I think, yes, is picking up as far as, far as servant names would be concerned. Farhat Sahib, I don't know about the Islamicate culture so much, Farhat name. Uh, is it a common name for servants? I was just wondering, this is just to you know, start and I'll uh, give the mic to Prabhu, uh, who's, who's the chair. And, uh, but uh, before that, uh, release it, release the book, all of you. Uh, thanks Orient Black Swan for uh, uh, taking part in the entire process and bringing the book out in time and looks like a nice uh, cover uh, to both the volumes. So let's uh, release it first. Yeah. And then Prabhu takes over. Uh, Ravikant, I also extend my welcome to all of you who have come here for this, uh, I hope, a interesting and um, illuminating discussion on what I would say is a path-breaking work, uh, path-breaking in many ways. But I just want to first lay out what we would going to do. We would have each of our panelists would speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, on themes which I think they know what they're going to speak on, given the vast uh, spread over time of this book. Uh, it may be important to just to focus on some themes and we'll have discussion around it. Uh, my job is not uh, merely to also to make it as, uh, as very much required by, by Nikhtin that should be somehow more conversational and uh, and you can bring out, of course, not many of you have read the book, but some many of us were part of the conferences which uh, went into this book. And so uh, just to briefly uh, set the context, uh, one theme about this book is the ubiquity of the servants and their absence in history, historiography. Uh, this particular conundrum is something which is uh, thrown up, thrown open in this book. Just to put another context to it, today there were two news reports which I want to just flag for you. One has come from in New York Times. This is a fascinating essay, pictorial essay of the last so-called so last Nawab of Awadh who lived in Malcha Mahal for last 30 years from 1984 onward, 35 years, uh, and the family which is now uh, gone. Uh, and as it turns out, this essay points out that actually there were imposters. They were just uh, people who were uh, f normal families, but who had migrated to Pakistan and came back and took on the role of the Awad Nawab. And uh, it happened, uh, Queen of Awad. And as it happened, she arrived on the platform of Delhi uh, station and stayed there for seven years. Uh, till Indira Gandhi gave the Malcha Mahal to them. And one of the things was, uh, amongst the photographs there, is of course 
how can there be a queen without a servant? Not just a servant, he, she had got a retinue of Nepali servants who, this writer writes, uh, would often uh, go on their knees. They don't even walk to her, would walk on their knees or crawl to her on their knees to, uh, to carry information. Someone uh, wants to ask a question to the queen, it has to be carried by the Nepali uh, bearer, whom I don't know how they, were, how they maintained it. But, but the servants were there. Uh, without the servant, even this four, uh, whatever, household of royal household couldn't have existed. And that's one. The second is it, uh, a news report which came out in Indian Express about its servant, as it happens, she was ultimately from Jamshedpur, where Pankaj comes from, where I have also, <laughs> she, she's, she uh, picked up uh, a very, very rare watch only you know, only a lister, high social socialite of of you know international socialite, in Cannes Film Festival every year. This company called Chopard, a French company whose watches are very very rare. Master had got it, and the servant flinched, uh, fl uh, took it off, and she was found out. So again, another theme uh, of uh, both of intimacy, uh, the awareness that this is valuable, and the news report ends with a statement that she wanted a high, high, lavish style lifestyle and uh, la and some land. That was her idea of uh, independence. If takes this very, very high-priced 25 lakh watch or something like that. Anyway, so just to point out that these themes are central to, uh, and there are some mighty punches in the book. Uh, they've landed in the right places. Most of it, uh, of course, uh, going to, uh, to labor historians and which is so I'm I've taken the punches I'm still standing for that and hope I'll be able to um, talk a little bit about that but before that let me just uh, say that this is uh, this is about servants past largely focused around what is called South Asia but which is actually North India it's most of its essays are North Indian essays. Not most, all of it practically are North Indian essays. And it spans a large time expanse. Even though it doesn't cross the Vindhyas, it does cross the um, ocean to, to, to open up to global history of servitude on the one hand. And most importantly, it looks at the history of the household on the other. So this both opening up to a wide expanse over time. I think it's very difficult. I don't know how my, my fellow panelists would handle it. So we would go by the standard Delhi University division between ancient, modern, and ancient, <laughs> which, which this book, this book, in fact, is actually one of the contributions of this book is to put all these temporal structures into the same page, at least, at least to understand over the same. Over the so I, I, I would ask uh, Mira. Uh, Vishwanathan to begin, and uh, we'll have 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes. I'll, I'll not, uh, I'll not stop you, Mira. You'll yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you, Nitin, Sina, Nitin, Verma, and Pankaj Shah for what is an exceptional book. I must say that I have only read volume one. So I can't comprehend the totality of the project, but some of the things I have to say respond uh, not just to the volume, but to the articulation of the project as a whole. Uh, as Prabhu pointed out, I enter this debate as a historian of the ancient past, but also as someone who has tried to engage with the limits and possibilities of long-term social histories. Uh, as a woman with two small children, let me use this occasion to record my debt to Nishu, Reshma ji and Geeta ji whose labor made it possible for me to frame this interjection. Since we operate within a structure of asymmetries, we must rec recognize them before we begin to understand their silences. This is an exercise that these books attempt for they repeatedly ask what it means to recover these histories. Servants past con constitutes a contribution to several emerging fields, to histories of the body, of emotion and affect, of the household, of family and of politeness. It also helps us rethink several existing fields, whether labor history, histories of state structures or social histories. It is a volume rich in reflection, but often unwieldy given the weight of these reflections. 
in the time that i have for discussion i cannot do justice to each of the essays in this volume remarkable as they are instead i will try and reflect upon some of the concerns of the project and the implications of what the essays say let me try and frame my response in terms of three or four key questions let's begin with the question of defining the category of servant you could argue that two volumes have been spent around this question so why am i uh, posing it again i do this because i want to raise the question of the usefulness of this category grief for the premodern period in her pioneering essay on dasas and kammakaras uma chakravarti pointed to the fact that there existed a spectrum of servitude that we need to be aware of this is an insight that this volume consciously builds upon in that sense one could argue that rather than looking at the servant as a category it looks at servitude as a range of relationships but i would argue equally that just as there is a spectrum of servitude there is a spectrum of service that we need to be conscious of thus how do we relate the labor of a servant to that of a water bearer or a dhobi who serves a range of households and is not fixed to a single home to that of the shagird a disciple of a master who is set various laboring tasks in the household but is not a servant how do we understand the labor of a woman who finishes her household work at home before appearing to serve the master or mistress all these experiences are of course linked to how we envision the household as a site of economic activity as a result it seems to me that it would be useful to differentiate conceptually at least between service servitude and slavery understanding that they represent a range of possibilities at any given point which is something that the essays in this volume do rather well uh, i think this is necessary because rather than giving endless elasticity to a category you sometimes need to pin things down to help analysis right um, and the reason i make this point is because if i look at the range of groups whose histories uh this first volume reconstructs for the pre colonial period right these are either groups at the top end of the spectrum so concubines kayasthas elite slaves or those at the absolute bottom right slaves so that's a question that i think we need to engage with that if we understand that there is the spectrum then why is it that our studies cluster at the two ends what happens to groups uh, in the middle because it's only when we enter the colonial period that often malis and masalchis pal palanquin bearers and water bearers start entering the conversation so i think there are a certain set of questions that we need to start asking about our sources how do we explain this is it because these categories do not exist earlier this is clearly not the case is it because the sources are framed by the masters and so we are limited in terms of the worlds that we can reach out to i am not necessarily convinced by this the issue to my mind has to do with how we frame the question of servitude or servility in terms of the relationship between caste and class often this exercise is difficult because it requires that we imagine into life a past that is different from the present we know certain kinds of surface uh, of service categories let's say pan bearers oil sellers mahouts uh, either no longer exist or where they do they are no longer part of our daily lives the nature of caste formation has also meant that new categories of laboring groups could keep appearing and disappearing in the record and further these questions have to be understood in re in relation to changing social formations and not just political regimes so let me take an example by what i mean so the introduction for instance glosses the word dasa to mean slave which of course it does but looking at the long history of the term at its range of meanings and usages you see that actually there are several shades of meaning that the term acquires over time right and that these meanings change with time so if we look at the point of its emergence in the rigveda it's actually an ethnic designation the dasas and the dasyus are the opponents of the aryas uh in uh, we know that in uh, the transition from the early vedic to the later vedic even if you don't want to use these uh, categories the dasyus are eventually wiped out and the term dasa comes to mean slave fine now Now, if you move to the early historic in a context where there is wage labor, the dasa kamakara represents a range of serving groups, with the dasa representing unfree labor. In the early medieval context, however, the term comes to be used with new meanings. The Alavad Prashasti of Samudragup, for instance, you know, one of the most famous kind of texts of Sanskrit epigraphy, has its composer Harishena, who we know is a Sandhi Vigrahika, a Kumara Matya, and a Mahadanda Nayaka, also refer to himself as the dasa of the king. Right? He's clearly. not a dasa um and in the medieval bhakti hymns the term comes to be used by the saints to refer to their bond with the lord hmm? uh, so in each changing context the word a 
acquires completely different shades of meaning. Um, but the term Dasi, on the other hand, has a completely different history, showing how the experience of servitude was often different for women and men. Consequently, it seems to me that there's a need to caution against using the rhetoric of servility to understand the experience of servitude, which is something I feel that several of the essays in this book, particularly those that are based on literary sources, do. Uh, so, for instance, even though he represents himself as a dasa, Harisena is not a servant, he is a high ranking official, a member of the elite. Okay? To take another example, let's say from a more kind of contemporary context, uh, if a woman tells her husband, uh, right? It doesn't actually mean that she's a slave or if the prime minister of the country exhausts, exhorts us all to overthrow uh, the shackles of Baraso Sal Ki Gulami, right? Uh, we have to take it, these kind of utterances as what they are, that is that they are rhetorical acts and figures of speech. So while I am in agreement that the everyday and the anecdotal bear the imprint of the deep past, as historians, it's also important that we understand how terms and context context change over time, right? And in the case of South Asian social history, over the very long time. Uh, so in this regard, one of the uh, rather interesting themes that comes up in the essay is uh, frame, the framing of the figure of the master or the mistress. And this is something that the essays, in fact, do rather well, whether it is in the codes for ethical comportment in the Aklak text or the experiences constituted as normal, right? How you would normally treat a servant or a slave in letter writing manuals. We can see that the power of the master is discretionary and it is at best subject to social control, which is something that changes in uh, the colonial period. Uh, so in this regard, it seems to me useful to think of like another term that has a long history, Jajman. Right? which comes from uh, the Vedic Yajman, and the, but the Yajman of the Vedic ritual is completely different in meaning to you know, the Yajman of a feudal social structure. Uh, and I think these are long-term histories that actually need to be addressed in terms of the sensitivity to text, context, and a changing time. Uh, they also have to be addressed, as several essays in this volume do, uh, in terms of the interrelationships between caste, class, gender, status, and power. Uh, but one of the things that is actually happening in uh, the essays that I've looked at in this volume is that they're often looking at urban or in courtly worlds, right? So how does the conversation about servitude change if we then start mapping rural worlds, right? And this is something that we uh, have to consider in uh, the long term of South Asian history. It's not just the figure of the master, it's also the figure of the mistress, right? Uh, and several... Um, very, very interesting essays in this collection uh, help us understand women as agents of repression. Right? even as they are oppressed and implicated in social hierarchies. So as I like to tell my students very often when we look at the story of Draupadi's dis disrobing in the Mahabharat, she does not question the existence of slavery. She only questions whether she can be enslaved after her husband has lost, her se has lost himself. Right? Uh, so the nature of those terms of reference are actually very interesting if you look at texts in the context of these times. Uh, given these, you know, many overlapping hierarchies and um, relationships, there is, of course, this question of how we excavate the possibilities of resistance. These could be, as the editors tell us, in laughter, language, gesture, speech, places of uh, access. They could also be in insolence, insubordination, and gossip. Hmm? But when we look at the sources, one of the things that we constantly have to ask is whose perspective is reflected, right? So humor, for instance, can often be a rather double-edged sword. To, to take an example, if we take the story uh, that um, is told in this volume, uh, which comes from the Pali Chronicles of Nanda, who is said to be a servant of a young Gahapati, who has been entrusted by the young man's father with the details of buried wealth. The young man wants to gain access to the wealth, which is this buried treasure, but when they reach the spot, uh, the servant stands on uh, that mound and starts abusing the master, saying, you servant of a Dasi's son, how could you have any money here? But whenever he gets off that spot, the servant returns to his servile nature. Right? Eventually, after this pattern is repeated a few times, the master realizes that the spot on which the servant speaks this way is where the treasure is buried. Okay? This is a story that was clearly meant to elicit laughs from those who heard it. Imagine a servant taking on the airs of the master. Better set that right at once. Uh, but what is interesting is that almost the same story structurally is told in um 
the medieval compendium of stories uh, the singhasan battisi where the story is actually about how king bhoja discovers vikramaditya's throne which is that this throne is buried in a field right and the uh, farmer who is in charge of the field whenever he gets on to that mound he starts abusing the king right but uh, no he starts speaking in um, he starts speaking words of wisdom and then whenever he gets off right he returns to his servile state so what does it actually mean when the same kind of story is being used over time over a very very long time and what is it that changes between one telling of the story and the other between one set of relationships uh, of servitude and the other because when the same story is told in the medieval sanskrit uh, text it the relationship is between a king and a brahmana right so there's clearly a shifting set of uh, registers and it seems to me worthwhile underlining that the change is not just between the pre modern and the modern rather there's several changes within the domain of the pre modern that we need to think about a uh, more insidious than the question of resistance perhaps is the question of boundary crossing right can these boundaries between master and servant be crossed and who is it who actually ventures to cross these boundaries uh, there is a rather interesting kannada poem from the 13th century which is called the yashodhara charite and it tells the story uh, though on uh, the face of it it is a, a biography of the king who's called uh, yashodhara um of the queen's unnatural passion for the mahout right so the story fluctuates between these domains of fascination and horror right the point of the story of course is that you're meant to feel disgust at this king's love for a slouching slave queen's queen's love sorry okay uh queen's love of uh, for this slouching slave bald with a dented forehead and with sore eyes but the fact that the story was told and retold between the 11th and the 18th centuries shows that it is a theme that endures and it is a fear that found repeated expression uh it's not only women who engaged in such boundary crossing a story from the madha pravas of vishnu bhat godse bhat ji which was narrated by my late uh, colleague aniket jawre tells of a brahman who falls for the younger daughter for the young daughter of a servant woman he has a liaison with her but he tells her that she can have liaisons with other men who caught her so long as she takes the precaution of collecting their sacred threads so the woman does this eventually the scandal breaks because the matter is ref- to the king and when this is done uh, the brahman asks the girl to bring the pot in which she has collected the sacred threads and ask the people in society to identify whose thread belongs to whom okay the king then says you know this is a situation that's getting out of control uh, so he says what do you want and the man says i want i request that uh, that uh, he and the girl basically be allowed to leave town together so even as we talk of a situation of you know crossing these boundaries involving a social death you do also have story stories where people cross these boundaries right and there are uh, a discussion of the implications involved there okay finally um i think uh, the question i want to dwell on is uh, something that uh, the editors of this volume particularly try to do which is uh, how is it possible to talk of a social history of south asia in the long term of course they um admit that the essays in this book are mainly north india focused uh, so in that regard as a project that clearly uh, people are invested in taking forward i think it's important to recognize that the region of south asia is constituted by a range of cultural enclaves involving different types of societies and we need to understand the interactions and hierarchies between them so for instance when my punjabi colleague complains about her jharkhandi made agnes it is a conflictual relationship not only between master uh, mistress and sir servant uh, but also between tribe and caste vegetarian and non vegetarian hindu and christian right so there's a whole range of oppositions that we sometimes might have to map how well do they map onto the past is a question that is worthy of analysis because a question that we could well ask is what would it mean for an adivasi to be a master ak ramanujan tells us the story of a gond peasant whose servant saves his life but despite that the master dismisses him right and the moral of that story is few people in that region trust a gond right so what do you read from that story do you actually read the fact that the cultures of servitude do not exist in that social setup or where they exist right they are not conducted with the kind of intricateness and intimacy that they are elsewhere huh? 
Uh, okay, so um, I think the, uh, there are, of course, several issues uh, that the book brings up, which I can't uh, dwell on, but I'm sure other panelists will. So to all those who are involved in this project and in the task of preparing these volumes, thank you for making so many of us think of these issues. And thank you for a project that expands the frameworks of our inquiry in so many ways. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Oh. Fantastic. Um, Farhat? Oh, well, I, <coughs> uh, I should begin by uh, congratulating the editors and the contributors uh, for this fabulous uh, book. Um, uh, it goes without saying that uh, recovering the uh, past of the servants uh, is a formidable challenge for historians, not just for South Asian historians, but historians well over. Uh, and one of the challenges that historians confront when, when doing a topic of this kind is the silences in the archive. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, one, of the, uh, one of the achievements of projects of this kind is to rupture the, the silences in the archive uh, and to give a voice to the voiceless. So that uh, regardless of the content of the volume, uh, this is in itself uh, an important intervention in historiography. Uh, <clears throat> in, in rare instances where we do get uh, the voice of the servant, uh, we are still not sure if, if the servant can speak. Uh, we are still not sure if the servant had the requisite linguistic and epistemic resources uh, to be able to articulate his or her experiences, interests, and aspirations. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, uh, it's important to ask a question that is raised by one of the contributors in the volume. Uh, can the historians speak? Mm -hmm. Can the historians speak about the servants? Can the historians speak for the servants? Uh, given the silences in the archive and our position, the position of the researcher, the position of the historian, the position of the scholar, can, can, the, can the historian speak for the servants. For this very difficult question, uh, the answer is actually a very simple one. Yes. Not at all, no. <laughs> uh, obviously a big, big no. Uh, and therefore one needs to recognize that uh, this project, uh, however good this project is, however brilliant this project is, is actually a fragmentary and partial account of the past of the servants. Uh, but even so, it is still remains an extremely significant intervention. And I think I could, I could see three or four important uh, reasons of important interventions that this project seeks to make. <clears throat> uh, the first thing is, the first, first important point that uh, I could see was the drawing on uh, on varied linguistic resources and skills. Uh, the contributors in the volume uh, draw out the connections between language, genre, and the representation of servitude and service in historical literature. That, I think, is an extremely important uh, issue that comes up in this volume. You have an essay by, on, by Pankaj on Sanskrit. You have contributors doing Indo-Persian sources. Uh, you have contributors doing Rajasthani sources, but from their very respective, from their very distinctive linguistic positions, uh, they, they raise issues of the relationship of language, genre, and the representation of service and servitude. Uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't, there is no advocacy for cultural history uh, in any of the contributions in the volume, uh, but I still thought uh, that the characterization of uh, literary flush flourishes uh, that that celebrate master servant relationship as a facade or a mask something that uh, is said in the introduction uh, is a wee bit reductionist uh, because it forecloses certain immense possibilities certain extraordinary possibilities that that cannot be taken up when uh, when when you close that option out by dubbing it as you know as 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 a mask or a facade, uh, but having said this, I still think that uh, it's an extremely important 
intervention in the sense that it it looks at language, genre, and meaning formation in an interconnected frame of reference. The important point here is that the experience of service and and subjugation uh, is located in a multilingual cultural space, and that that brings out the richness of uh, the past of the servants. Uh, the second thing you will tell me when to no, start. No, no, uh, the second thing that did appeal to me uh, was uh, was that the contributions, uh, without exception, uh, move beyond the master servant dayard to connect the dayard with social institutions, ascriptive identities, and political change. And this, I think, is an extremely important method of doing uh, history. Uh, and the result of this is that this intervention is not just about then, not just about the past of the servants. It is also making an important intervention in the social history of the period. Uh, this is, I think, an extremely important uh, feature of this volume. In this context, I thought uh, uh, we need to ma mention some papers. I thought Pankaj Jha's paper was an extremely important intervention because it sought to connect uh, servitude or service with the caste system uh, and, and, and brought out the linkages between servanthood and caste identities. Uh, in so far as the medieval and early modern period is concerned, uh, unfortunately, caste has been totally under-theorized. And therefore, I think this is an important paper in raising substantive issues in the way we do medieval history. Uh, but when it comes to the Indo-Muslim cultures, uh, the connecting point between servanthood and uh, becomes slavery. And in that context, I think the paper by Sunil Kumar uh, is extremely important. Uh, Sunil points out. Um, Sunil points out the transformation or the the transition from bandhagi servitude to service. Uh, but the tension between nokri as nokri and bandhagi, bandhagi being servitude and nokri service, uh, is ultimately resolved later in the period by service becoming a form of servitude. So that uh, so that you know the nokri or service is inflected through the category of servitude or bandhagi, uh, which actually draws our attention to the ambiguity, uh, something that she pointed out too, ambiguity in, uh, in labor services, ambiguities in experiences of subordination and marginalization. So the categories uh, overlap, <laughs> categories move from one, one domain to another. Uh, Sunil also points out as to how uh, the category of bandagi uh, is a category of subjugation in one context, but when the same category is used to invoke uh, mystical experiences or is inv invoked in context defined by mysticism, this becomes a category of empowerment. So one needs to be attentive to content, but also needs to be attentive to the ambiguity in these categories and the malleability of of you know of of uh, how services move from one domain to another. Uh, given uh, similarly, I thought uh, the connections that some uh, scholars, people like Priyanka, uh, Gitanjali, and Shivangani, uh, sought to make between uh, servanthood and household uh, was also an extremely important intervention, in the sense that they they make an um, they make an uh, a persuasive argument that one needs to be attentive to institutional changes in the structure of the household, as also changes in the distribution of affect and emotions in the household, uh, to be able to understand the experience of domestic service in the early modern period. Uh, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that domestic service is not seen as shaped by the master servant dayard, but is seen to be located in, uh, in, in social institutions and cultural forces. Uh, and this, I think, is, is an extremely important uh, intervention that this book makes. Uh, 
given the overlaps uh, between slavery and domestic service, uh, it may well be tempting uh, to, to, cease, uh, to cease domestic service as akin to uh, social death. Uh, an implied argument is there in some of the contributions, uh, but I, I, I don't think that's, that's very, very valid or very appropriate. Uh, neither, uh, this, could, this could not be an argument that could made, be made either for slavery or service in the case of, uh, in the case of South Asian historical experience. Uh, for two reasons, one is, one is that, you know, these, these, these relations transcend the dyad. They transcend the, the tie up of the master with the servant, uh, and they are therefore located in wider social institutions. Uh, secondly, uh, as, as the paper, I think you were the one who wrote that one, Calcutta? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the paper, uh, as he sh is, the, this whole issue of servant crisis uh, reflects or re reveals uh, the kind of agency that the servants had because one of the reasons for the anxieties that the masters had with reference to the servant-master relationship was the inability to control them, inability to make them obedient servants. And, and the element of disobedience actually suggests the level of agency that the servants had in social life. So I think I'll end here and, th okay, and thank congratulate you. the editor once again. Yeah. Well, so let me also begin by congratulating uh, Nitin, Nitin, and Pankaj, the triad, Bihari triad. <laughs> well, I found the book interesting. I'm only going to speak about volume two. I've made some efforts to, to read the first volume, especially the introduction, but I'm just going to stick to, to the volume two. Uh, it's, it's ambitious not only for the subject matter, but also because uh, I think what, what uh, the editors have attempted and what many of the authors have attempted is to try and also speak about debates in historiography and around questions of agency and power. And one of them, you know, I'm still wrapping my head around it, which is around the question of lateral agency. So someday I'll understand it, but, but the, clearly there are important questions about is it simply about recovery of voice or can you think about agency differently? Does agency have a history itself as a concept? So any case, there are important questions there. Uh, that many authors have asked. Uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, is, is try and organize my thoughts uh, on the different essays around three, three W's, and I'll speak about them in a moment, and uh, how. So the W's are very simple. It is who, what, and where. Uh, and the who question is very similar to the question that Mira raised, which is uh, who do we speak of when we speak about the servants? Uh, and as is evident in the essays, uh, certainly the first uh, set of essays, which is around the early years of the 19th century, where typical English households could have anything ranging from 10 to 30 servants, uh, each doing a very specialized task from, from ayahs to masalchi and chaprasi and khidmatkar, etc. cetera. Uh, Indian homes similarly uh, have a whole range of servants from Bavarchi to uh, Mali and others. But the interesting point is by the time you come to the central essay of the book, uh, central in the sense, the one right in the middle of the book, which is by Shalini Grover on expat communities in Delhi today, there is typically just one maid, who's, who she calls the all-rounder maid. And what you get across these essays, therefore, is a certain transition that has happened where the many servants give way to one or two servants. And that's a story that you can find across different essays. Uh, not all authors have made the attempt to speak of it as that kind of a transition, but you can tease it out uh, from the essays. Uh, three broad points have been made about this transition. The first is something that the editors do in the opening essay, which is to say that some servants or some kinds of work simply fade away with time, uh, with technology. So typically they write, uh, for instance, uh, once electricity comes, you don't need the pankhawalas or the bhishtis anymore. Uh, but once the car comes, you need a driver. So there's some relationship between technology and the kind of service that is required and the kind of service that are going to be present. Uh, 
There's also a suggestion that a distinction has to be made between servants who are imagined as part of households and those who come in for specific tasks. And among the latter are a whole range of women servants uh, who in one of the essays, I think Prabhat's essays or, or Charu's essay, I forget now, there's a suggestion that men should be especially wary of these women who walk into the house from the Bhatiarin and the Paniharin to Dhobin, Nain, Gwalin, Teli, etc. Which obviously means that if you read it the other way, there's always either the actual case of sexual harassment and violence or certainly the potential for it when it comes to many kinds of services that are rendered by servants in households. Uh, so uh, that's, that's another point that comes through uh, in the reformist literature of the latter half of the 19th century. Uh, there's another issue which comes through in the latter half which has to do with uh, how does one understand the relationship between the home and the public. Uh, now, sanitation workers, for instance, uh, Tanika Sarkar writes, were early attached to specific households. Now, once municipalities get set up, they become municipal servants and public servants, and many still continue to remain part of households. And the question, therefore, to ask is, uh, in the sense of who uh, do public servants count uh, in, in our description of servants? Uh, do private service providers count? of the kind that we thought, once the darji is out of the house, or uh, do those kind of people count? And if they do or they don't, then for what reason? And, and I think that's a question that across several essays you can figure out. Uh, the one distinctive point about the who that the editors emphasize and several of the writers emphasize is that it has to do with the wage labor. And that one way of making the distinction between dependent labor inside households and people whom we call servants is those who are paid wage and those who aren't. Uh, but even here, uh, there's some caution that Samita Sen suggests uh, that we must maintain because of the affinity between slavery and domestic service. Uh, there's also a distinction between care work and stigmatized work that Nitin Varma suggests has probably been overemphasized. And, and in Prabhat's essay, which is using you know satirical literature from the 20th century, uh, there's a frequent overlap of the figure of the wife and of the maid, suggesting that in several contexts the unpaid labor of the housewife could be imagined as no different from that of the paid labor of the maid or the male servant. This is also a point that is made by Charu. So basically what, what these different authors are suggesting is that there are ways of making the distinction, but you need to be very careful because quite often seva and seva bhav and nokri go together. So even if there is wage, these other things continue to be around. So that's, that's the who question. So there's a broad category of people and, and how do we go about recognizing who they are and what and how to write about them. The second W is, is about what uh, and what do servants do. Now quite obviously from the names that, that I read out, you can make out that there are specific tasks that they perform. But one of the beauties of this uh, collection is that there are several unexpected contexts which you would not imagine, at least not immediately imagine, the tasks that the servants do. So in Charu's essay, for instance, you find servants negotiating in the marketplace on behalf of, uh, of, of women who employ them, and these are women who have come into property through some means, and they need these servants to go out into the marketplace and, and negotiate on their behalf. And similarly, in, in, uh, in other essays, a couple of essays, you find the ayah who travels between India and England, accompanying the English family and the child. Uh, so these are people who travel a lot. And, and sometimes, uh, you know, they, they go to Mauritius, they go, they go very far. And in Shanley Grover's essay, you encounter the cake baking, picnic organizing, contemporary maid of the expat household. So clearly there's a range of tasks that, that, that servants perform. And my sense is probably by focusing much more on the who, the what question may have been a bit underplayed. And, and maybe there's, there's more work to be done there. I mean, it's almost taken for granted what do servants do. Uh, but but you, could, you could do more with it. Uh, there's also, I suggest, a very different question regarding the what, uh, which is to ask what is being attempted in the various sources uh, when the figure of the servant is being deployed. And this is largely drawing upon Carolyn Steedman's work on England, where she writes, uh, the domestic servants were used more than any other social group to write histories of the social itself. They were employed by all manner of legal theorists and political philosophers, 
to think or think through the social and its history. And this is an insight uh, that several of the authors uh, pick upon uh, to write about what is the project that is being attempted, uh, what is it being written about. Uh, so for instance, uh, the opening essay by Satyasikha Chakrabarti is suggesting that the servant figure, both in texts and in paintings, was deployed to think about the empire and about maintenance of intimacy and distance. And how do you do it? Uh, and Anyana's essay on the training of the servant class highlights anxieties about distinguishing between British men and women on the one hand, and not only the natives, but also the European underclass on the other, which is often to be found in the city. So that was a project. And in Prabhat's essay, it's, it's about the about anxieties about the Hindu social order or the emerging nation. And there you have a very interesting insight that sometimes that the, the nobility of the servant is used to critique uh, the elite Indian and British. Uh, the idea being that these elite uh, indulgent Indian men and women will not be proper subjects of the nation. And, and so it's through the figure of the, of the, of the servant that uh, their, their indulgence is questioned. Um, the third W is, is where, and this is something that I, I'm very interested in, uh, uh, is uh, what is the space that we're talking about, and this is something that Mira also pointed out. It seems to me that most, most of the authors have taken for granted that this is an urban context. The, some of the sources that they have referred to uh, also suggest that it quite may well be a rural household, or certainly a household in a kasba rather than a big town. So there's the question of whether it's a rural or urban context, whether it is a large feudal household or small apartments uh, of Indians or of British or of the expat. Uh, and also the question of how do we pose the relation between the household in which the servant works and our own house. Uh, so if you take up the first of these questions about the broad spatial location, it would seem for the most of this, as I said, the Indian household is in Calcutta or, or, or the British household in Calcutta and households in a range of mid-sized towns from Patna to Kanpur. Uh, and this urban setting, the essay suggests, has to do with histories of migration and of job opportunities, as also with changing architecture and housing stock. Uh, my own feeling, again, as with the what question, far more can be done with the where question, uh, uh, in terms of locating where the service is being performed. Uh, what has been done in the essays is probably we get far more about the where within households, okay? And, and there, there are some very interesting insights that are offer. Uh, for example, the difference between the kitchen and the toilet, both regarding the task to be performed and the servant expected to perform it, or the difference between the cook and the method, uh, to put it simply. Uh, who can enter the house, when, from which door? Uh, where can dishes be washed and by what route shit taken out? Uh, these are important questions in locating the servant. So where is the task being performed? What kind of task is being performed? Uh, I, I think I think there, there's something to be done there, uh, which which many of the essays hint at, and maybe if one thinks of further work, these could be pushed. Uh, quite clearly, these are issues uh, that are tied to notions of racial and caste purity and pollution, uh, as also hierarchies within the category of servants themselves. But it is also about what is considered the essential duty of the housewife who must continue to perform certain tasks, even if there are servants available, especially uh, cook for the house, uh, members of the household. Uh, uh, the one suggestion that I have in this regard is maybe if, for, especially for those who did the later half of the 19th century, early 20th century, if they had looked at the question of hygiene, uh, there is a lot available there in terms of how these relationships are changing over time. And, and maybe that's one entry point to think about the kitchen and the, and the toilet, for instance. Uh, I would also suggest that perhaps the idea of time in relation to work can be pushed a bit more. Uh, there is a difference, say, between the bari dai, who becomes a bari over a certain length of time, and somebody who comes to work for a limited period of time, let's say for a couple of hours in different households. Uh, there's difference between the servants who have been attached to one household over generations, and those who are m more contractual in the sense that we know of, of contracts today, or indeed, as, as Jana suggests, uh, for some lower class European women, uh, domestic service simply being an interlude between education and marriage. Uh, so there are the different notions of, of time here at play, and, and these are the 
ways in which it can be woven into the story of the servants. Uh, many, I say, have done this, uh, but perhaps m not as self-consciously as, as could have been done. So these are three Ws, uh, the, the who, the where, and the what. And then the final question is therefore how. Uh, and and uh, you know, how do we read all this? Uh, there are three main sources that the author suggests, the editor suggests. Uh, there's the judicial archive. Uh, there is the advice literature, of both for Indian women and for British women, about how to treat the servants. And there's a whole bunch of visual and, cult and literary material in which servants figure uh, either as major or minor presences. And uh, uh, these are used by almost all the scholars uh, uh, to ask a range of questions. Uh, uh, from, from a historiographical perspective, I thought Nathan Varma's essay was the most ambitious, uh, trying to write, uh, asking the question, what do these fragmentary court accounts allow you to tell? What kind of stories? Uh, how do you relate uh, micro histories to global processes of empire formation and mobility? And, and those kinds of questions. Uh, I, I thought he, he took on some of those questions uh, you know, head on and, and tried to do something with it, which, which was good reading. There are obviously a lot of other interesting things in the book. I would highly recommend that you can go and buy your copy or wait for a non-commercial copy, which might take time, but <laughs> arrives in time. <laughs> it's no your choice. I would not uh, recommend uh, anything that would uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. take away from the publisher's efforts, uh, but, uh, but definitely it's worth a read. Take your time uh, and, and do go through them. I have two, two or three concluding observations. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And I'll just wind up. The first is around the periodicity that is being addressed. The first set of essays is around early 19th century, mostly ends by about 1830s. The last set of essays is around the uh, first decades of the 20th century. Uh, and there's a whole period between 1830s and 1890s that goes completely unaddressed. Uh, one reason could be, as in any related volume, uh, the authors have different interests and maybe the authors who contributed to this volume have their interest in these periods. Uh, my own sense is that perhaps it could uh, be for a different reason. Uh, my hypothesis is, uh, uh, just reading this book, that maybe the English household question was resolved uh, in the early years of the 19th century in the same way that the Indian woman question was resolved, as Patha Chatterjee says in the closing decades of the 19th century. And that's why those two decades then become more fascinating for historians to write about, or it is simply a gap that it is a better place to tell us why, why this exists. But it, it is a gap that exists. Uh, the second observation that I have is around mobility. Uh, my sense is that much of the literature that is examined by the authors assumes a bounded household, where the master of the house is stepping out for work while women remain confined inside. Uh, but Almost all the essays hint that this is not quite the case, certainly not in the 20th century, where many more women are stepping out of homes uh, to work as teachers, to work as social workers, as, as political actors, doing a range of things, which means that the assumed presence of the mistress in the household, constantly there next to the servant, uh, is not always the case, and, and which should lead us to ask different kind of questions. Uh, uh, so when Mira thanked the people who helped her put this together, Clearly, this is not the same mistress of the kind represented in his essays, who's constantly inside the house, just looking after the household work. Uh, uh, several other essays suggest uh, also that servants maintain their own homes, which also means there's a mobility between the site of their homes and the site where they work, which is another thing to look into. And of course, mobility across the empire, as I said, uh, which again is, is something that can be considered more head on. My final quick point is regarding the sources. There are three major sources that I said that the authors have looked at. But if you take these questions of where and what seriously, my sense is that even more conventional sources, simple annual sanitary reports, you know, hygiene reports, uh, housing reports, all of them uh, have a lot to offer. Uh, and, and newspaper advertisements on new housing products, etc. There's a lot that can be mined there. It doesn't need some extraordinary source or some very different kind of source to be able to recover this history. But 
if we if we ask different kinds of questions of more familiar sources, we could still go a long way. Uh, but that would be about another book. Uh, Ashish Nandi is not here. He always says, "Bhai, sab kuch ek hi kitab mein likhwa loge kya?" So we will wait for those other books. In the meanwhile, thank you very much. Yeah. And, uh, thank you. Um, before I just open it.